Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank Rahiba again for sharing her inspiring story. It's really remarkable. Uh, first, on behalf of American Airlines, we want to apologize for not making it last night for the discussion of the film, The Finland Phenomenon. American had a little equipment problem in Dallas, and that's why I was so late. I apologize. Actually, American doesn't apologize at all. It was just me. <laughs> but I, I'm glad to finally be here, because I'm an enormous fan of the International Baccalaureate Program. I think you're really doing some of the most interesting and exciting work of educators anywhere around the world. Having said that, I think IB, like all education organizations, share some extraordinary challenges in the 21st century. Challenges, the result of which are from a rapidly changing world, changing so quickly all around us that it is very hard to see and to understand. How many of you have read The World is Flat, Thomas Friedman's book, 2005? About half of you, good. I recommend it for those of you who have not, because he describes a very rapidly changing world where work is being transformed. Any job that is a routine, white collar, blue collar, doesn't matter, in, especially in our developed countries, is rapidly being either automated or shipped off to countries that have the cheapest labor. I talked to Friedman recently, and he said he had one thing wrong in that book. I said, what? He said, the pace of change is happening so much more quickly than he ever imagined. So that's the first challenge we need to understand, the rapidly changing nature of work and what that means for young people. What skills will they need? The second challenge, of course, is the explosion in both the access and amount of information. And the two go together. The more knowledge there is that is available, the more Work demands people who know how to access that knowledge and apply it to new problems and new questions. So I've been trying to study these two trends. I've been kind of on a, an odyssey for the last seven years, trying to understand the changing nature of work, the explosion of knowledge, and what that means for us as educators. So I want to share some things that I've been learning. Fundamentally, what I've come to understand is that the world simply no longer cares how much our graduates know. Knowing more than the person next to you is no longer a competitive advantage. Because the knowledge is right here, changing constantly, growing exponentially. And the student who can, in fact, access new knowledge just in time learning, rather than relying on prior knowledge, has a distinct advantage. What the world cares about is not what our students know, but what they can do with what they know. What can they do? How can they transform what they know? Answering a new question, solving a new problem. That is a completely different education challenge. It is a matter of developing students' skills and their will, their motivation. So what I want to talk about, skill and will. Skill. After I read Friedman's book, I embarked on a very different kind of research. I talked to a very wide range of business leaders in a number of countries, from Apple to Unilever to the military. I talked to college teachers. I talked to community leaders. I talked to students who were recent graduates, asking everyone, what are the skills that matter most today in this knowledge economy, flat world? And what did they see as the gaps? And I came to understand that there's a set of core competencies, intellectual competencies, in addition to what I would call the habits of the heart that have always been and will always be important, things Ian spoke so movingly about. In addition to those qualities, there's a set of core competencies that are not only important for work, but equally important for continuous learning and for active and informed citizenship in a global society. I've come to call them the seven survival skills for careers, college, and citizenship. Very briefly, they are. Number one, effective oral and written communication. Sorry, start uh, earlier. The, the first one before communication is critical thinking and problem solving. Over and over again, I heard that the 
businesses that engage every employee in a process of thinking critically about how to improve their product, their process, or their service. Profit, nonprofit, big business, small business, does not matter. Companies that engage the intellectual capital of every employee are always the leaders. But when I ask senior executives, well, what do you mean by critical thinking? Because for us, you know, so often it's kind of a buzzword. You know, we educators will say, oh, when we're asked, what's critical thinking? Well, it's, critical thinking is kind of like thinking critically. It's kind of a circular thing. But for them, it's very clear. It's not about having the right answers. It's not about having more answers. It's about the ability to ask the right questions, to ask really good questions. Problem posing being more important than problem solving. The second skill is collaboration across networks and leading by influence. Increasingly, all work is being done collaboratively. More and more, it's being done virtually. So for example, when IBM has a new client, new problem to be solved, they pull together a team from their different centers around the world. So a deep appreciation of differences, cultural, religious, ethnic, the ability to work with people very different from yourselves is critically important in this new workplace. But even more, the ability to lead peers by influence has emerged as a critical capability. The mid-level supervisory forces are gone in most businesses. Supervisors don't tell you what to do anymore. You're, you and your team have to figure it out. The third skill, agility and adaptability. The pace of change, the complexity of problems, really demands that everyone be far more agile and adaptable than in the past. Fourth survival skill, initiative and entrepreneurialism. It was Mark Chandler, who is vice president and general counsel at Cisco Systems, who explained to me how very important these capabilities are and how large companies work to keep these capabilities alive in these large organizations. He said, if I have an employee who sets and meets five goals, 100%, straight A in our world, that's no longer good enough. He said, if on the other hand, I have an employee who sets 10 stretch goals and perhaps only succeeds at seven or eight, he or she is a hero. But what would that person be in our schools? They would have missed two or three out of 10. They'd be a C or a B student, right? I'm going to come back to this issue of failure in a moment. The fifth survival skill is effective oral and written communication. And it's the number one complaint of both college teachers and employers. A senior executive at Dell Computer said to me, you know, the reason these kids can't write is they don't know how to reason. They don't know how to develop a coherent argument. And he said, that's only half the problem. The other half, he said, and endeared me, I'm a recovering high school English teacher. He said, they do not know how to write with voice, meaning they don't know how to put their own passion and perspective into their communications so as to be persuasive. The sixth survival skill is accessing and analyzing information. We all know today, knowledge glut, the ability to access, analyze, to do an effective internet search, to understand what the biases are, to understand what the sources are, to use and apply that knowledge is an absolutely essential skill in the 21st century. The seventh and last survival skill, curiosity and imagination. Now, how many of you are familiar with Daniel Pink's book, A Whole New Mind? Raise your hands, many of you. Daniel Pink talks about curiosity and imagination as being increasingly important in very sophisticated consumer economies because he believes that we, sophisticated consumers, want more products and services that are more creative, that are more empathetic, more fun to play with, and that values the, the so-called right brain skills, curiosity, imagination, empathy, and so on. But I've come to see these skills in, in a very different light in the context of new research that I've been doing for the last three years, which I'm about to explain as soon as I find a water bottle here. So this book that I wrote, The Global Achievement Gap, came out just about four years ago. The Global Achievement Gap, by the way, is the gap between the new skills all students need for careers, college, and citizenship, the ones I've just described, versus what is taught and tested in many of our very best schools around the world. 
we're simply not focused on teaching, in many cases, systematically, the skills that matter most. So that's what I wrote about in that last book. And that led to sort of an extraordinary set of occurrences for me. Invitations from Taiwan to Singapore to Finland to Bahrain to Thailand to England to, to, to Spain to speak to audiences, not just educator audiences, but leadership audiences. Wall Street to West Point. And in every case, people nodded their heads, said, yep, these are exactly the skills we need, and yes, indeed, there is a global achievement gap. But then the second thing happened. Our global economies collapsed. And I saw students who were college graduates coming home, seemingly having mastered many of these skills, unable to find a job, having graduated with a great deal of debt and unemployed. Right now in the United States today, the unemployment rate of recent college graduates is about 22%, and the underemployment rate of those same recent college graduates is about 23%. Underemployment meaning they have jobs, but they're not jobs that require a college diploma and don't pay college degree wages. I understand in many of your countries, the numbers are the same, or in some cases, even much worse. So what went wrong? They had skills. But we had an economy where to succeed, you need something much more than skills in light of the collapse. So as I studied this economic collapse and you know, tried to understand credit default stock, uh, swaps and, and hyperinflation in real estate, trying to understand what is the essence of this problem and what skills, what beyond these skills will our young people going to need to succeed? What are our countries going to need to succeed? I came to understand that increasingly our developed countries are more and more dependent upon consumer spending as the engine of growth, as the engine of our economies. More than 70% of the American economy is based on consumer spending. And in many of our countries, that consumer spending is fueled by debt. In, in 2007, the savings rate in the United States was minus 2%. So leading me to conclude that in many of our developed countries, we have economies based on people spending money they do not have to buy things they may not need, threatening the planet in the process. Those economies, in my view, and in the view of a growing number of economists, are simply not sustainable. We cannot be so dependent upon consumer spending, especially as people are laid off and they start saving rather than spending. Right now, the savings rate's about 4, four or 4.5 four or 5 percent in many of our countries. So people are not going out and buying the kinds of goods they once did to the same degree. So what's going to be the engine of growth in the future in our developed countries? If we, we're going to try to be less reliant on consumer spending, which is not sustainable economically, environmentally, or even spiritually, what's going to replace it? As I read, the more I learned, the more one word kept leaping off all of these pages. Innovation. We have to produce young people who are innovators. We have to create generations of young people who are able to solve more different kinds of problems in more ways, beginning with how to create a sustainable planet. Now, let me be clear. Not every young person is going to become a Steve Jobs. We're not talking necessarily only about those kind of breakthrough, disruptive innovations in science and technology. We're talking about the idea that every young person is born with curiosity, imagination. Every young person, four-year-old, asks 100 questions a day. But too often, four or five years later, that same child may not be asking very many questions at all. That curiosity, that imagination, that creativity is all too often schooled out of us, in the words of Sir Kenneth Robinson. So I became interested in the question of what must we do differently as parents, as teachers, as mentors, and as employers to make sure those 
qualities are not stifled, and in fact, that we much more intentionally develop the capabilities of many more young people to be innovative in whatever they do, to, be, to bring that spark of imagination, that spark of a curiosity and initiative to whatever it is they do, to think, of, think about problems and possibilities in new ways, in every kind of work. So I took on a very different kind of research. I started talking to young people who were highly innovative, all in their 20s. Some were innovative in science and technology, some innovative in the arts, some who were social entrepreneurs and innovators. And then I studied their ecosystems. I tried to understand what had helped them to develop these capabilities. They were not truly extraordinary individuals, some were, but many were just you know, good, solid students, but who were innovative, who approached things in thoughtfully different ways. I interviewed all of their parents, trying to discern patterns of parenting. I then asked each one of them, can you name a teacher or a mentor who's made the greatest difference in your lives? Students from disadvantaged schools frequently had a hard time mentioning a single teacher. But they could all at least name a mentor. About three quarters of the students could name a teacher, and the teachers ranged from elementary school to graduate school. Very wide range. Then I interviewed every single one of those teachers and mentors trying to see if I could discern patterns of teaching and learning that had made the critical difference. I made a discovery that I continue to find disturbing and challenging for all of us. In every single case, the teachers who had made the greatest difference in the lives of these young people were outliers in their educational settings, teaching in ways that were very different from their peers next door or down the hall. And at all grade levels, they were outliers. I interviewed five college teachers, for example. Again, teachers whom these young people had told me had made the greatest difference. So I went to Harvard, MIT, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, Tulane. None of the teachers whom I interviewed had tenure, nor were they going to get tenure. But then what I began to realize is that in every case, while these teachers were outliers, they taught in ways that were remarkably similar to one another and very consistent with the teaching that I see in those very, very few programs that really do develop innovators. I'm talking about the Olin College of Engineering, a brand new school. I'm talking about High Tech High, New Tech High, in the United States and elsewhere. I'm talking about MIT's Media Lab, the Institute of Design at Stanford. In all of those places, Teaching looks fundamentally different than it does in most high schools or most universities. And I came to learn that the culture of schooling, as we have so often experienced it, is radically at odds with a culture of learning that produces innovators in five essential respects. Number one, culture of learning is all about celebrating individual achievement. We have bell curves, we have GPAs, but the culture of learning to be an innovator is all about collaboration because coll innovation is, in fact, a team sport. And in every case, these teachers and in these programs I mentioned, accountable teamwork is built into every single assignment. Number two, culture of schooling is all about specialization. You know, we've divided and conquered the high school universe by content subject areas. We call them Carnegie units. It's a 125-year-old system. But the culture of learning to be an innovator is problem-based learning that crosses disciplinary boundaries. I talked to the director of talent at Google, Judy Gilbert. She said to me, if there's one thing educators must realize is that problems today can neither be understood nor solved within the bright lines of individual academic disciplines. Number three, culture of schooling is very often risk averse and we penalize failure. We discourage, in many cases, students and teachers trying new things, taking initiative, especially as you go higher in the grade levels where it's all about maintaining a high GPA. It creates risk aversion. But the culture of learning to be an innovator is all about learning how to take risks and learning from mistakes. I went to IDEO, 
the leading design company in the world that also does consulting for innovation in major corporations. They said, we have a motto here. Our motto is fail early and fail often. <laughs> Try that out for your school. <laughs> you see that mission statement? <laughs> we fail early and often. <laughs> <laughs> but what they meant was that there is no innovation without trial and error. You know, we talk about research and development. That's a fancy word for trial and error. And they talk about rapid iteration, trying something, learning from mistakes, moving forward. I went to the Institute of Design at Stanford, which was started by folks from IDEO. And they said, yeah, we're actually thinking F is the new A. Try that one out. I talked to a student at the Olin College of Engineering, and he said, you know, we don't talk about or even think much about failure here. We talk about iteration. Iteration, moving from 1.0 to 2.0. The whole idea being that if you fail because you've been lazy, that's one thing. But if you fail because you've reached for something, tried something new, done an experiment, been intellectually sort of taken a risk, and you come short, that's not failure. Not if you have the opportunity to reflect on it, learn from it, and try again. That's iteration. How do we encourage more of that in our schools? The fourth contradiction is in the very nature of the learning process. So often, in, as the higher up you go in learning, the more passive the learning experience becomes. In fact, I sometimes wonder, is that where we learn to be such good little consumers? Consuming information passively and then regurgitating it at the right moment. By contrast, in all of these other classrooms that produced young innovators, learning was a creative work. Students producing real products for real audiences. Students having to solve a real problem, answer a question, generate a new question. But there were products things that they created in every class. The last contradiction is maybe the most important one from our point of view here. Culture of schooling is very often extrinsically motivated and rewarded. A's and F's, GPA, uh, pizza on Fridays for good test scores too often in many schools. But what I came to understand is that these young innovators, both from backgrounds of privilege and poverty were far more intrinsically motivated, more so, I think, than previous generations. They want, more than anything, to make a difference in the world. Not to make more money, but to make a ding in the universe, as Steve Jobs puts it. And then when I looked at what did their parents and teachers do to encourage and stimulate that intrinsic motivation I came to see a pattern. The pattern was from play to passion to purpose. Parents encouraged much more exploratory, free-form play. Kids' days weren't programmed to the hilt. They had fewer toys. Toys without batteries, sand, blocks, clay, paint, water. And later, as they were older, toys like Legos. They limited screen time. At the same time, they've tried to provide their young people a kind of a buffet of opportunities, not pushing them into classes at every free moment, but a buffet of opportunities where young people could find and pursue a passion. That these parents valued finding a real interest in pursuing it more than academic achievement for its own sake. Teachers the same. Teachers building time into all of their classes for students to pursue a project, to, pursue, to, to create an inquiry or an investigation to really discover what was it that most interested them. And then as the, these young people pursued interests, both teachers and parents wisely did not peg them to their interests, did not say, oh, well, you know, he's interested in science. He's 12 years old. He's going to be a scientist, or she's going to be a doctor, or whatever. No, they knew wisely that those interests would change and morph and evolve as these young people grew older. And in every case, the evolution became a kind of sense of purpose for these young people. They evolved into a sense of wanting to make a difference in the world or wanting to give back. And that sense of purpose was an expression in, at the adult level of both play and passion. 
was a driving desire to really do something that mattered. Both parents and teachers had actively encouraged that, that sense of wanting to give back, wanting to make a difference, even if it was in a small way, the moral element, as Ian proposed in his remarks. So where does that leave us? I'm going to make a couple of sort of observations. Then I want to sort of tell you a short story about a video. And then we're going to have time for questions and discussion, because I wanna, really want to hear what you're thinking and what's on your minds. Here are a couple of closing thoughts to think about that the balance between knowing stuff versus being able to apply what you've learned has shifted fundamentally and irrevocably. And so what matters more today, yes, you need a body of knowledge. Yes, you need uh, some content expertise. You know, expertise is a ticket to play, but it does not make you in any way a player. The critical difference, the value added, the competitive advantage is in skill and will. So I think the questions we have to ask ourselves as teachers every day is for, are first and foremost, what skills am I developing? Am I developing these skills that others have identified as critically important? How am I doing that? And how am I assessing those skills? And what is the performance standard for those skills? And can we begin to map a performance standard, let's just say for critical and creative thinking, collaboration, and communication? Can we set performance standards and I know you have performance standards for your essay, your theory of knowledge course, and so on. But performance standards for these skills, which can be demonstrated in multiple ways for the end of 12th grade, and then backwards mapping that to the end of 8th grade and the end of 5th grade, or thereabouts. Can we create an aligned and coherent program of merit badges, if you will, that are certifications of ma progressive mastery of these skills? And then there's the matter of will. To what extent are we really developing intrinsic motivation in our classes? How much time do we give in a week to students finding and pursuing an interest, exploring a passion? How many of you know about the 20% rule at Google? Raise your hands. Not very many. Well, you know, one engine of innovation in companies has been to give employees permission to play on company time. Started with 3M. 3M had a 15% rule. 3M, the, the manufacturing company, gave engineers 15% of their time, their work time, to play on projects of their any kind. How many of you use Post-it notes? Do you know those? Well, you know that was a failed glue, glue that didn't work, and an engineer got curious about it on his own time, his 15% time, he started playing with it, and lo and behold, we have Post-it notes. In Google, every employee, not just the engineers, have 20% of their time, the equivalent of one day a week, to work on any project of their choosing. They voluntarily kind of organize in teams or in groups or task forces to work on new projects. And that's where most of Google's innovations have come from, playing on company time. Now, what would happen if we devoted 20% of a student's school day, school week, school year, to pursuing interests, finding and developing passions? What if we were a little more intentional about ensuring that every teacher had some time to, to teach his or her passion, either curricular or co-curricular? What if we tried to bring more play, passion, and purpose into the classroom? How might we see some fundamental changes? The last challenge I will offer you before we have some little video and then some discussion, in order for young people to learn to innovate, they need role models. To what extent do you offer a model, a role model as an innovator? To what extent are you willing to take risks? To what extent do you have play, passion, and purpose in your work every single day? OK, a little quick story. Some of you saw the Finland phenomenon last night. And I'll be interested if some of you have questions. Bob Compton, my colleague, and I made that film together. And when we were talking at a cafe in Singapore a little over a year ago about my new book, which is called Creating Innovators, he said, Tony, you can't just write a book about innovation. It has to be innovative. I thought Guten Gutenberg had already solved that problem. So I said, what do you have in mind? He said, well, 
here, let's put these new things called QR codes or tags in the text of the book, and which when you scan with your smartphone with the right software, it will show a video. I thought that was an interesting idea. So Bob Compton spent eight months of his time traveling all over the world shooting 150 hours of video, which he distilled into about 60 minute to minute and a half videos, which you can access with your smartphone in the print version of the book, or also um, in the various ebook versions. And so we put together just a little minute and a half trailer to give you a flavor for what, what kinds of uh, material are in the videos and what you might expect. So we're gonna show that, and then we're gonna have some questions and discussion in our last 15 minutes. So can we show the video very quickly, please? How important is innovation? How important is oxygen to life? If America doesn't produce high imagination people, we are going to be a very poor country. Raising um, someone with an intention that they'll be an innovator is actually different than raising a child um, that you want to behave all the time and be quite compliant. Some of the people that are the most rambunctious seem to sometimes have the best ideas. I want to feel like what I'm doing every day matters. Of course my guidance counselor told me to go straight to college. My dream manager might not have told me to do that. I came to Tulane because I really wanted to go to a university that was committed to public service. The philosophy of high tech high is founded largely on the idea of kids making, doing, building, shaping, and inventing stuff. The MIT Media Lab spent far less time in formal classrooms learning theory and far more time on projects building things. Knowledge in a sense is a commodity. You can get this on Google. Uh, it's about asking the right questions. It's about having the right insights and perception. Let them fail because they're going to learn more from that than we could ever teach them directly. Our success is measured more or less by the rate of innovation. Okay, there are three mics, is my understanding. There's one there for sure, and there'll be others perhaps wandering around. I would love to hear your questions or comments, but I ask you please to make them extremely brief so that we have more time for comments and questions. Save the speeches for afterwards. I'll look forward to hearing them uh, in the lobby. But com quick comments or questions. Yes, please. Now, I'm a high school English teacher. I know all about wait time. I have 15 free minutes. How about you? <laughs> Yes, please. Tony, you mentioned IDEO, and I just wanted to let everyone in the audience know that they have put out a downloadable uh, kit online called IDEO's Toolkit for Educators. Right. And I found it's a fantastic little set of ways to go about developing something new for anything you might be involved in, but especially education. Yeah. And uh, when I taught in Munich, we talked, took, took our students to IDEO, and they went through a design workshop, and it was amazing. First they were taught to empathize, then they were uh, brainstorming with uh, no criticism of any of the brainstorming. Then they went into a prototype sort of arts and crafts uh, facility to grab anything they wanted and create prototypes, um, multiple iterations as you say, and then present them to their peers. And the, uh, the design goal in that particular case was to come up with uh, something that grandparents and grandchildren would like to do together. So there were oh, things fabulous. like party trams and whatnot. Fabulous. But it was it was really fun. And then afterwards, we took our students to our lunchroom at school and said, "See if you can reinvent the lunchroom, so that people put their recyclables where they need to go. They have uh, better ways of crossing paths when they're uh, bumping into each other and whatnot." And they came up with very creative ideas for uh, burping recyclable bins that, that gave a nice reaction or maybe an incentive for putting something in the recycling bin. But I think it's really great to start thinking about IDEO and some of these things. And I don't know if you have any comments about right. what you've experienced uh, at the design school at Stanford or with IDEO. I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. Well, I think that's a wonderful story, and I really don't have anything to add, except that, you know, as you look at that, it's a set of skills, beginning, of course, with empathy, an emotional skill. Uh, and, and it transcends disciplines. 
But thank you very much for sharing that. Other comments or questions, please? There's three mics here. Yes, please. Hi, Tony. Good morning. I wonder if you could speak to implications for our current teacher training models. Uh, I hear my airplane calling. <laughs> I have to tell you, I'm disheartened by the kind of programs uh, in most countries that I see for teacher training. Uh, they're cash cows for too many universities. Uh, you contrast that with what some of you may have seen in Finland, where teacher training is much more like a medical residency program, where, first of all, teachers become experts in their content areas and have to do a real master's degree in a content area, but where they also spend a year in close collaboration with a master teacher and other peer student teachers. Um, that's a costly program, uh, similar in Singapore. And I think if we're really serious about transforming education and meeting the challenges of the 21st century, that is going to have to be the model. And then in terms of our ongoing professional development, you know, more than professional development in schools, I want to talk about coaching. Because I think that's how we get better. You look at how athletes improve continuously. They get coaching. Their, video, their practices are videotaped. Their performances are videotaped. Their critique, they videotape best performances and are being coached to a performance standard. I think that has to be much more of the model in the future. Yes, please, in the center. Thank you, Tony. Uh, performance standards you mentioned, but they're tied to assessments. Could you refer to any best practices you've seen for kind of outside the box assessments? Well, first of all, many of the things you all are already doing, I think, are best practices. But I would like to see them extended. I would like to see every student have a digital portfolio beginning in first grade, that follows him or her through school. There's a new website called PathBright, P-A-T-H-B-R-I-T-E dot com, which is a great free uh, web-based application for constructing portfolios and sharing them. So I would start with that. I would start with designing exhibitions of mastery. So for example, in ninth grade at High Tech High, in order to complete ninth grade, every student has to be on a team where they are required to develop a new product or service, a new business. They research it, research the need, they write a business plan, they write a, a budget, they write a proposal, and then they present their proposal to a team of venture capitalists who've come in to judge their work. So those kinds of tasks, real world tasks, that engage students in, in, and require multiple disciplines in teams are things that I think we need to think much more about how we design and embed into our curricula. Over here, please. Hi, Tony. You mentioned the importance of uh, sustainability in, in uh, innovation. How much do you think we should be doing as, a, as an organization to be joining with other people to push these concepts of, of sustainability and the need, the need for new approaches in education and in our, in our economies? Well, I will be very candid. Uh, I'm truly frightened about the future. And I think unless and until we really think about sustainability as a way of life and as a way of learning, I'm not sure we have a lot of time left. And so I think it is a critical, critical need. But sustainability, in a sense, bumps right up against how we define growth in our societies. We define growth as increasing GDP every year. We have to, I believe, work not just with other educators, but to work with our leadership to think about growth as, as a quality of life. In Bhutan, they talk about gross national happiness as opposed to gross national product. So I think we have a great deal to contribute to that very, very urgent conversation. Yes, please. Uh, hello, you spoke to begin with about how many- I'm sorry, a little closer to the mic. I'm having a hard sorry. time. Sorry, can you hear me better now? <laughs> You spoke to begin with about many of the teachers that you saw that were outstanding were often the outliers, and then went on to talk about how we had to model innovation for our students. Do you think this is something that we could coach all of our teams so that all of our teachers could become great innovators, or do you think it's something that we need to address much earlier at, at the, who, who, who takes on teacher training programs? Who do we want to be the great modeling teachers that we're going to be seeing in the future? I think both are important. Uh, the, m the concern I have is that traditionally, I believe education has been a profession that has attended to attract people who are risk averse. You know, they love learning, they were very good at it, they like the classroom, it's a comfortable, safe place, don't wanna leave it. And I think we're going to need a different kind of stance in our profession to succeed in the future. 
And some of the best teacher education programs are for embedding teamwork into their work. The High Tech High, for example, was so dissatisfied with the quality of graduates from some of the best schools of education in America, they started their own graduate school of education. It was very uh, powerful. In Finland, teachers are encouraged to think about continuous innovation in their teaching. It's not the idea that you, you simply just do what you did last year. You are, you are a scientist trying to really more deeply understand problems of learning and how to be more effective. And you're working in networks collaboratively with your colleagues on problems of practice continuously. Yes, please. So in terms of risk aversion and the things that you've been talking about, where we need to go, our school had the privilege of listening and working with Carol Dweck this year. And in her book, she talks about the importance of taking risk and the importance of embracing failures. But even though we are, I think, quite convinced as to the power of this, we still sense a tremendous amount of fear in our students, a right. tremendous amount of fear in our parent community. So I'm just curious what you would say in terms of strategies yes. around that. First of all, I would eliminate the word failure. I would talk about iteration. Very, very different concept. Secondly, I would rethink grades. Personally, the only grades I could justify as a teacher, and the only grades I gave were A, B, or incomplete. I set a performance standard for a B. I expected every student to meet that performance standard. I did not vary that standard. What I varied was the amount of time or resources individual students may need to meet that standard and the amount of support they might need. Some students took much longer than others to meet that standard, but the standard stayed the same. The standard was also visible. I showed them what quality work looked like from other classes, different ways in which you could show mastery. Then we also discussed excellence, an A. What is an A? An A should really stand for excellence. And I think that's the challenge is to help students be more oriented to the adult world. In the adult world, you know, anybody want to fly with a C minus airline pilot? How about a D plus dentist? No, we expect competence and we celebrate excellence. And it should be no different in our schools, in my view. So those are two things. The third thing I would do is incent teams of teachers to come up with new ideas to buy and to take risks and to iterate. How many of you have a research and development budget in your schools? Raise your hands. Yeah, it's a joke. Microsoft's re research and development budget is 17%. Cisco's is 13. Google, as I explained, well over 20. You want to see more innovation and risk taking, iteration in your schools. I encourage your leaders to establish R&D budgets. Explain that to their board. There is no change. There is no risk taking without some kind of incentive, without R&D. OK, over here, please. Um, I would prefer to do my question in Spanish regarding you speak very good Spanish. And maybe you can help me to do this. Lo siento mucho porque se me olvidó casi todo mi español. Me falta práctica, me falta vocabulario, pero dígame algo. Okay. Uh, but then someone translate it for me, please. I can't. I, I can try to do it in English anyway. If you were in my shoes or in the shoes of everybody here and you have the opportunity to get involved in any of our schools, which will be the first three steps you will do to do the main changes, what you think has to be done in the schools to do, go to the new stage yeah. in education. So we can have like a goal, concrete goal, a concrete um, homework when we come back home to do something different out of the box and take advantage of your knowledge. So yes. I will appreciate you give us that help yeah. to increase our work and reach the goals you pretend we do. Yeah. Thank you. No, entendí. Um, Mix and match, whatever. Uh, I, w I really wish I could speak Spanish well enough to, to do that. But I deeply believe the only kinds, kind of change that is lasting has to be owned and shared. I don't believe in buy-in, the pop popular word for change. I believe in ownership. And the first challenge I believe we have as educators is to really understand this changing world through discussions, through study. Asking ourselves, what are the most important changes that have taken place in the last 25 years in our world? What must we do to prepare our young people for a rapidly diff changing and evolving world? What skills matter most? Yeah, Tony Wagner says this, you know, the Partnership for 21st Century Skills says that. 
Create your own list. Don't rely on mine. Yes, you may find the global achievement gap in creating innovators useful as resources. A lot of people use them as book studies. Great number. Find that as a, as a way of creating a background. But then I think you need to define your outcomes in terms of the new challenges and demands all of our young people are going to meet, have to meet. And then think about how you best assess these skills. Define critical thinking. What is it by content area, by grade level? What evidence tells you a student can think critically? What is the performance standard? What should it be for a 12th grader for critical thinking? How do you build collaboration in? How do you develop intrinsic motivation? But I think you have to own the problem. You know, so often we want to be problem solvers. We want to know what to do on Monday. But first we have to be problem identifiers. We in education have an affliction I call answer-itis. We too often start with solutions to problems that are not well understood, answers to questions that have not been adequately explored. So I urge you as a first step to engage in adult learning with your faculty about this changing world and then create a strategy that is an appropriate response that you own because that's the only kind of strategy that can be sustained over time. Folks, we're just about out of time. I'm very sorry that I won't take any more questions because I promise to end at 10.30, uh, but I will stay out afterwards and sign some books and have some conversation. I simply want to end by thanking you. IB is already in the leadership of innovation in education. Your IBCC program, uh, the certificate program for careers, I think is a wonderfully important innovation. So much of what you do, the requirement of, of the, the research paper, uh, all of the work you do around projects and exhibitions of mastery have long been in the forefront. So I simply want to, while having challenged you, also thank you for the incredibly important work and the many things you have given to education around the world. Thank you very much.